All right, welcome to another awesome video for AP Statistics. Sorry, I got a little bit of laryngitis, so you're going to have to deal with the raspy voice. All right, in this video, we're going to learn about what's called a t-test for the mean difference in a paired sample. Now, the name is kind of confusing, but we're essentially going to run a test of significance, but it's not based on a mean of one set of data. It's based on the mean of a difference of data in a paired sample. Now you might be like, okay, what the heck is that? Well, that's what I'm going to try to explain to you in this video. All right, first and foremost, the type of test I'm going to show you in this video is just like a t-test for a sample mean that you've already gotten really good at doing. The only difference is what mean we are looking at. In these problems, there is one sample, but we are going to look at the sample twice, perhaps before and after. So maybe we measure a bunch of people before something, and then we measure the same group of people after. So each person is paired with themselves. Or maybe we do a dominant versus non-dominant, right? So we have everybody throw a baseball with their right hand, or excuse me, with their dominant hand. And then we have them throw a baseball with their non-dominant hand. So we have one sample. <laughs> but we're measuring everybody in that sample twice before, after, dominant, non-dominant, what have you. We call this a paired test because each person is essentially paired with themselves. The main idea is that we only care about the mean difference between all the measurements. So let's look at a rough example. Let's say that I have five people and I have each of them throw a baseball with their dominant hand and I measure how far they could throw it. And then I measure how far they could throw that baseball with their non-dominant hand. So I only have one Susie, but I have her values are paired up, her dominant and non-dominant. So it looks like I have two sets of data, but I really only have one set of data, all coming from these five people. So the key thing is here is I don't care what Susie did with her dominant hand. I don't care what Susie did with her non-dominant hand. I care about the difference. Because I'm interested in, is there a difference between her dominant and non-dominant hand? So what I really care about is the negative 6. I'm sorry, oh boy, I'm bad at math, right? The negative 7. Negative 7 is the difference between her non-dominant and dominant hand. For Dave, his difference was negative 2. For Kevin, his difference was negative 7. For Sally, her difference was negative 8. And for John, his difference was negative 7 as well. Well, I take that back. Sorry, again, I, I'm bad at math, right? Sometimes people like me are really good at the hard math, but we struggle with the simple math. So 45 minus 52 is negative 7. So I was right the whole time. I just <laughs> looked at the numbers wrong. Sorry about that. So again, the point is, is that each person was paired up with themselves, but all I truly care about is the differences. Now, I subtracted non-dominant minus dominant. I could have subtracted the other way. I would have gotten all positive numbers. But in that scenario, I would be testing to see if the dominant hand was better than the non-dominant hand. You get the idea there. So it's important to understand that in these type of tests, I really only have one set of data, and that one set of data is the differences. But it came from data that got paired together, like I did in this example. So this is where we have a test. So again, in this problem, I would be testing the alternative hypothesis. Can you throw further with your dominant hand? And to do that, I would need to have everybody throw with their dominant hand and with their non-dominant hand. And I don't really care what you got for each score. I care how much further you could throw with your dominant hand. Now, in that way, if I'm going to word it that way, this would be positive 7, positive 2, positive 7, positive 8, and positive 7. Hopefully that all makes sense. So once you understand that you're going to run one of these tests, the work is essentially the exact same as we've been discussing. First, we have hypotheses. Now there is a slight change to our symbols here. We're now talking about a mean difference, a true mean difference. So we just put a little D down there underneath the mu to represent that we're talking about a difference. And the null would be that there's no difference. Status quo. Your left hand, your right hand, your dominant hand, your non-dominant hand, there's no difference between them. And the alternative is my claim. I claim that there is a difference greater than zero. If that's if I'm trying to show that your dominant hand is better. 
if I was trying to show that your dominant, your non-dominant hand was better, then I would go with a different symbol, right? So just like we've always seen in these problems, you could choose a less than sign, a greater than sign, or not equal to sign. If I didn't care which hand was better, all I cared was that there is a difference between your two hands, then I'd go not equal to. If I clearly wanted to make the claim that your dominant hand is greater than, then I would use a greater than hand because I would expect a greater difference. I'd expect the dominant hand to have a greater difference, to be bigger. And that is um, how you choose your symbol there. But it is important to know that you always use zero here because if there is no difference, then that means that our alternative is wrong. There is no difference. Your dominant hand is no better than your non-dominant hand. Now, the conditions are all the same. Got to be a random sample to avoid bias. Second condition is that your sample has to be under 10% of the population to assume independence. And the third condition is that you do need to be big enough. So make sure you check that condition. Again, if your population is already normal, any sample is big enough. If you're 30 or larger, central limit theorem says you will still proceed with a normal model. And then the third condition, or the third option there, excuse me, is that if your sample is really small, like the previous one I had with only five, you might have to check your data and make sure there's no outliers or skewness. All right, so now the work involves around you saying, okay, I need to assume the null is true. So I need to assume that the mean of all my mean difference, now remember, I'm just going to look at my mean difference, but I need to build a model that represents all mean differences. So this is a sampling distribution for any potential sample difference. And I'm going to assume it's a big, beautiful zero to put smack dab in the middle of my model. Then I'm going to have to use standard error. Oh, man. I wish I could use standard deviation, but I'm not going to know ever, in most situations at least, I'm not going to know sigma. I'm just not going to know it. So I'm going to have to replace the sigma with S, the standard deviation of my differences. Notice I put that D there to emphasize that we're working with differences. And this is why I have to use standard error, which means that this is going to be a T model and not a normal model. No big deal. We know how to handle that. So once you build your model, you're going to locate your mean difference. And you're going to find it on your model. If it's out on these tails, more than likely it's going to be significant. If it's not, then it's probably not going to be significant. We need to locate it precisely with a t-score, and then we're going to use that t-score to find a p-value, and you will need t-cdf on your calculator to find that p-value. You're then going to make a conclusion based on that p-value. So you're either going to fail to reject the null and say, you know what, I just don't have enough evidence that my dominant hand is better. Or you could reject the null and say, wow, I do have evidence to show that throwing a baseball with your dominant hand is better. All right, let's take a look at a full example here, all done for you, so that you can truly understand this. All right, instead of talking about throwing a baseball, let's talk about pain. A study was conducted on the effects of hypnotism on pain. So the idea here is that people that experience pain, let's just say in their shoulder, if uh, I could hypnotize you, to believe in that there is no pain in your shoulder, can that really relieve your pain? So we had eight subjects that volunteered for this. They all had pain, and we had them rate their pain on a scale before they were hypnotized. One, meaning little pain. Twelve, meaning severe pain. And then we also measured them after they were hypnotized. Now, the question is, is there significant evidence that the mean pain rating was reduced due to the hypnotism for these patients. So here are my eight patients. I took their names away to protect them. And for example, patient A, well, patient A is actually a weird patient. He or she had a pain rating of 6.6 .6 before, and their pain got worse. But every other patient did have their pain go down after the hypnotism. But this is clearly showing that I have a paired test. I only have one set of eight subjects, but I measured them twice. So I really don't care about any of the numbers in this table. What I care about are their differences. So patient A, after minus before, was a difference of positive two. They gained pain. Person B, 2.4 minus 6.5, negative 4.1. They lost some pain. C, negative 1.6, 
D, negative 1.8, E, negative 3.2, F, negative 2, G, negative 2.9, and H, negative 9.6. These are the numbers. These are the differences that I care about. And what I need to do is I need to get a mean difference of my sample, and I need the standard deviation of those differences. To get those numbers, I'm going to go to my calculator. I'm going to go stat edit. I already have them typed into the calculator. I was planned ahead here. I typed in the differences. Again, don't type in before. Don't type in after. I don't care about those numbers. I care about the difference. Because the only way I could show that being hypnotized makes you have less pain is if I show that there is a difference. So once you have those typed in, you're going to hit stat, go to calc, run a one variable stats, make sure you choose the proper list, list one for me, dive nothing in frequency list, and you will get the mean difference, negative 3.125, which means the average of my eight people was a loss of 3.125 pain. The standard deviation was 2.9114. I'm going to write those numbers down because I will need them for the rest of my problem. Now, the null and the alternative. Well, the null would be status quo. The true difference, the true mean difference is zero. That's a really ugly D there. Sorry about that. I'm going to assume that there is no difference. Hypnotism doesn't do anything. Come on, give me a break. And the alternative is that, remember, I wanted to reduce your pain. So the alternative would be that the true difference is less than zero because less than zero would show that you did have less pain. All right, that was step one. Step two is those conditions. Well, I have to assume that my people were randomly picked, which is kind of hard to do because they had a volunteer for this, but sometimes you don't have a choice when you're doing an experiment like this. Number two, eight people is clearly less than 10% of people that have pain. And the third condition is I actually need to check my data and make sure there's no outliers or major skewness because I don't know what the population is. So remember, with a calculator, it's really easy to check this. I already have the data entered into my calculator. All I got to do is uh, hit second y equals, turn plot one on, make sure that you have the histogram highlighted, and make sure you have the proper list. When you're ready, whoop, excuse me, when you're ready, hit zoom number nine, which is our zoom stat. Now, I don't see any major skewness, right? Major skewness. Some people might say, oh, no, is this an outlier? Well, not really. I mean, it's not like it's that far away. An outlier would be way over to the left somewhere. I mean, this doesn't look beautiful, but I only got eight numbers in this histogram, so I'm not going to see a whole lot. So I don't think there's any major outliers going on here. All right, now comes time for the work, and this is my favorite part. I have all this done very nice and pretty for you so you can understand it better than my crappy handwriting. First, I need the center. Well, I'm going to assume if this model represents all samples, not just mine, all samples, I'm going to assume the mean of all potential samples is going to be zero, right? Because I have to assume that hypnotism doesn't work. Then I'm going to have to show how it could deviate. Well, I wish I could use standard deviation, but because the only standard deviation I have is that of my sample, that was my S, I'm going to have to use standard error, the twin brother standard deviation. Don't worry about it. The only issue is that this is officially a T model. I know it looks a lot like a normal model, but guess what? The T model kind of does. Now I'm going to take that standard deviation divided by the square root of 8 to get my standard error of 1.0293. So I went up from 0, I went up, 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 standard errors, down, 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 standard errors. Now it comes time to find my sample. Remember, my sample difference was negative 3.125. And that is way over here somewhere. And I'm going to tell you right now, the eye test tells me that this is pretty significant. My T-score is confirmed by taking my sample minus the mean. Remember, I expected there to be no difference. Divided by the standard error. Wish it was standard deviation, but I just can't. And I get a T-score of negative 3.0360. I then need to find my P-value, which is the probability of my sample happening or more extreme, which in this case would be even lower. To do that, you need TCDF, so I'm going to go and choose TCDF. Well, um, I forgot to turn my calculator stat wizards on. Oh, it is turned on. Why didn't that work right? All right, let me just try this again. So second VARS TCDF. 
There we go. Okay. Um, and I grabbed the wrong one, of course. I'm so sorry. I'm clumsy today in this video. Second vars. TCDF is number six. I went a little bit too far last time. There we go. Okay, now we got TCDF. So now I want to look below. So I'm going to start at negative 99. And I'm going to go to an upper value of my T score, negative 3.0360. And I have seven degrees of freedom, sample size eight, eight minus one is seven. And that's where I got a P value of 0 0.0095. Now, at this point, we should all know what to do with that conclusion. With a p-value that low, that means my sample is very unlikely to occur if the null is true. My eyes show me how low this sample is. My t-score shows me how low this sample is. I think we only have one conclusion to make. And here is my conclusion. Since my p-value is less than my alpha level of 5%, 0.05, I will reject the null. There is evidence that the alternative is true. Now, please make sure to always include context. The question was about hypnotism and can it reduce pain? So I can officially say that hypnotism can reduce pain for these subjects. Now, on a side note, do not say that hypnotism can cause, can reduce pain for all people. Keep in mind that this was an experiment. And if we think back to our an experiment unit, if an experiment involves people who volunteered for the experiment, anything you learn can only be said for those volunteers. If you did not randomly choose those people from the entire population of people that have pain, then you cannot say it works for all people. So the problem kind of just said I got eight people that were willing to do this experiment. So all I could say is that <coughs> hypnotism does reduce pain for these subjects. So that's kind of a separate topic, but an important one to start thinking about in preparation for the AP stats test. So this is a paired t-test for a difference. Hopefully it makes sense to you guys. The idea is very simple, is that you have two sets of data, but they really came from one sample. The data was just paired up. Before and after is probably the most famous example of this, but the, the trick is as long as there was one sample and the numbers connect to each other, like Susie's value, Susie's other value, John's value, John's other value, regardless of before or after or dominant, non-dominant, that's a paired test. And you don't care about those numbers individually, you care about the differences. You care about the mean difference. So hopefully this all makes sense if you need to go and watch it again. And listen, if I didn't describe things very well, there's lots of other very good videos on YouTube that do describe this. All you gotta do is go to YouTube and search T-Test for a paired difference. And I bet you could find a lot that probably describe it even better than I do. So please get ready, please watch this video, please learn from this video, and be ready to go. All right, guys, see you on the next video. Hope you enjoyed it.